what movie or series lit your fuse and made you have to tell stories on screen? Well, you know, first of all, I have to talk about my background a little bit because I started out as a ski filmmaker. I was dedicated as a dedicated skier and I just loved alpine skiing. So if you ask me what movies I have mo watched most, it would definitely be one of these ski movies that I watched when I was young. It was this Carving the Whites were one of them. And I probably watched it every day when I came home after school uh, and a couple of hundred times at least. So ski movies were, were the thing that made me want to make movies. And I started to make ski films when I was between 20 and 25. I had this as a profession. I was traveling around in Europe and, and in the Scandinavian mountains, a little bit in Alaska, filming skiing in the, in the winters and editing it together in, in the summers. Uh, but then I started at film school in Gothenburg in Sweden. And that was basically my first connection with, with the film history. And uh, uh, I started to look at the filmmakers that were in the cinemas at that time. And I especially remember one uh, film that I went to when I was in my second grade on that, on that school, on The Bachelor. And it was Code Unknown by Mikkel Haneke. And uh, uh, the feeling that I had of that screening uh, of this film, because I feel it was such a humanistic approach to all the characters in this film. He was taking them all very seriously. He was trusting me as an audience. Uh, it's not a, 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 like a straight plot or anything like that. It's, it's more, how to say, fragmented. And uh, it's not 100% sure how these fragments are connected together. And he trusted in the audience in such a way that I had to be on my toes through the whole screening. I have to try to understand where is it taking me? What is going to happen now? And, and what is it in these scenes that are important, uh, important for, the, for the broader concept? And then it's one of the scenes in this film where the character that is played of Juliette Pinoche, she's going on, a, on the metro, on a subway. And it's two young men that start to, you know, they, they, are, they are like trying, they are harassing her. They are they're doing something uh, uh, that is making it scary for her to be on this subway. And it's a scene that is maybe around... I think it's around seven minutes long or something, and you really follow the scenario. You get the feeling of being in one of these subway carriages. And uh, uh, the presence and the feeling and the suspense in that scene uh, made it exhausting also to watch, to watch it. Yeah. Mm. Um, and it was something with the whole experience of Code Unknown. So when, when the film was finished and and I, I was supposed to leave the cinema. Uh, uh, it was the feeling of a before and after when I watched that movie. And, and uh, the feeling that I wanted to pick up every trash uh, after me in the cinema. I didn't want to leave anything for someone else to take care of. Uh, uh, and and it, was, it was a huge inspiration for me. And, and I, I still think about that film quite often. And I, I think about Mikkel Haneke's approach when it comes to, to the audience. And I think about the, the kind of suspense he have managed to create in that movie and many of his other movies. But that was really the moment where I felt, okay, fiction movies is maybe something that I want to work with. Yeah. Uh, because that, before that point, I thought that I maybe would uh, make documentaries. But that point was like, okay, I had such a powerful experience of that movie. Hmm. And w was it the idea that it made you want to create moments that are going to rear back up in the audience's minds after again and again and again? I think it was, um, it was definitely the approach that I felt that he trusted me as an audience and that he wanted me to reflect over the content. He wanted me to ask myself questions. And... Uh, uh, he wanted me to create something that I also had, pro had to process after I've left the cinema. So, I mean, Mikkel Haneke is not a, a filmmaker that is wrapping everything up and like, hey, now you can leave it behind. You, you can come back to his movies and sometimes ask yourself, why did he do that? And what, what, what was the decision that he, he did that? And uh, uh, Code Unknown um, also starts with a very beautiful shot of uh, 
it's a group of young uh, people that have a hearing disability so they are talking in sign language and they do like a kind of charade they are like trying to imitate something and the other people in the group are, are guessing what what are they imitating and uh, uh, these scenes are are framing the film of code unknown in, in such a beautiful way so he, he's very interested in that kind of elements i feel and and uh, i thought it was uh, it was something that just left me with something that was a bigger feeling or a bigger experience of the cinema than than the, the cinema in itself it, it connected me with some problems or some questions about society and the outside world and uh yeah it just activated me as a, as a viewer okay so now your trajectory is fast you know you won the can prizes but when you were finding your voice as a dramatic filmmaker what movie came along that you watched and you thought oh my goodness this is so the, the bar is so high here can i ever measure up oh <clears throat> Well, a movie that I always comes back to is Once Flew Over the Coco Nest uh, by Milos Forman. And uh, uh, the way that Milos Forman is looking at uh, his character is that basically how he's looking at other human beings. He has a, uh, he's such a warm approach and, and a very, I'd say, forgiving and understanding approach to it. And uh, quite recently, I was re-watching uh, Once Flew Over the Coco Nest and if you look at the first 10 minutes of that movie, it's very interesting to 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 realize how how much have passed, how much time I've passed now. And the first 10 minutes of that movie is so rich uh, and how he managed to tell those first 10 minutes without feeling that the, the pace is very high or anything like that uh, is it, super, super impressive. And of course, when you started to be a fi feature filmmaker, and I made my first feature films. The goal was in some ways that one day maybe you will have a premiere of one of your films in Cannes in competition. And uh, because that's where were your heroes were showing their films. Uh, and so, so when, when the first time I was invited to Uncertain Regard with a film that was called Involuntary, for me, that was the big step. For me, that was like, Okay, uh, now I'm actually uh, participating in this world where, where where all the directors that I look up to are presenting the films. But you know, slowly also you get used to it, and slowly also you get, uh, I'd say, yeah, you, you you start to understand how that world world is working, and you understand that um, uh, um, the way that you are trying to make movies and you want to break through in this world. It's like something that is a knowledge about also the social game that is going on. I'm sorry, I have to tell tell you, talk about these things, but it uh, and you start to how do you say be skillful in in, in playing that that game. Uh, uh, so, but in the beginning, it was definitely like the feeling of of uh, um, yeah the Milos Forman. Like I also love, love Leo Carax movies, uh, Paolo Sorrentino, uh, and all these directors that I looked up to. They they presented the films there. So, whether it was a work of yours that succeeded, or approval from someone whose opinion really mattered to you, what first gave you the confidence that what you were doing could be important, and in fact, you could belong. The first moment that happened was when I was in the film school and I basically only had made ski films before and I was starting to make documentaries on the film school. I went to a film school where we were studying documentary and fiction at the same time. Uh, and it was a three year directing school, a bachelor uh, directing school. And I had made a film or I was making a film about my parents, my parents that had been divorced for 23 years. And all of a sudden, both of them were singles again. And I was putting them together in front of the camera and I asked them to talk about the divorce. I wanted to compare their two different visions they had about the divorce. And 
also I was putting them together in front of the camera, maybe a little bit with the hope that maybe they actually would get together again, because I could tell that they liked each other really much still, and they were constantly talking about each other, even, even though they had been separated for such a long time. And I was uh, uh, filming the, that documentary myself, uh, and I was filming my father uh, when I asked him, tell me about Katarina, tell me what you remember about her. And he was going into these very long pauses and standing and thinking. And uh, then when all of a sudden, when he got an impulse to start to tell, he started to tell about this memory and he did it in, in a very beautiful way. And I showed this one of these scenes to one of the teacher at school. His name is Kalle Boman that today is a very close friend of mine. Uh, and, and Kalle, he had been working in the film in industry since the 60s. And he had been working with uh, a Swedish director that's called Bo Widerberg, and he had called, uh, also worked with Roy Anderson. So I had a great respect for Kalle also uh, at this moment. And he looked at this shot that I had made of my father, and he said to me, that's basically how Bo Widerberg works when he does his fiction movies. There's no difference before, between your method when you are now filming your father, because I also asked him, do it, today, do it again. Let's, we walk over here, tell me again. Uh, and he said, like, it's exactly the same, same kind of method. So when he said this for me, it, it, all of a sudden I started to think, aha, maybe actually fiction film is something that I can work with. Because for me, it was something that was like a m much bigger machinery, a production that I, that, that I didn't really want to go into. But he gave me the key that is, of course, a little bit inspired of the 60s movement in the French New Wave, that you have a small crew and just go out and do the movies. So it was that moment when he said to me, this reminds me a lot of how Bo Wiedeberg is shooting. Wow. Yeah, that's quite a compliment. Well, now, so what would you say was the biggest obstacle that you had to overcome to allow you to turn the movies that influenced you into your own language as a filmmaker? I think that it's to be a filmmaker. Everything is time when you're starting with some, something and you're starting to try to visualize the idea that you have in your head. You know, you're starting to create an idea. Ah, this is going to be so interesting to try to put on the big screen and, and trying to visualize. As soon as you start to try to do the casting, when you try to do everything that is uh, all the elements that you need, you are going to meet obstacles. And it happens every single time of the process. It's not getting easier to make a movie. The first time you make a movie is just as hard as when I'm making a movie today. Because when you are then starting to look at it, you, you feel something is wrong. It should be in a different way. And then you have to be very patient when you're trying to change the, the, the objects and, and, and change all the parameters in order to reach what you want to reach. And the thing is that you never know how long it takes to get to the point when you feel, ah, there it is. So in the beginning of working with the film, it's very important for me to have quite much time. I can't go on set and be like, okay, we have to be finished with this scene. Tomorrow we're going on to the next scene. When I'm shooting the first scene of a film, I have to have 10 times as much uh, uh, on, on set and on the production than I have with the rest scenes because I need to get to the point where I feel, ah, there it is. And this obstacle is like something that is, of course, a pressure when it comes to economy. It's, it's like the, a time aspect of it. Mm, mm, and it, happen, it, it happens in, during every, every process and every, every new feature film I'm working with. Mm. I wanted to spend a moment on Triangle of Sadness. And this is a fascinating movie. You know, there's a, a bit of tragedy in that your lead actress, uh, you know, um, passed away shockingly. But now you have this um, film that is nominated in the major categories and is alongside these, these gazillion dollar blockbusters. So, you know, what burned in you um, about this script, about this subject that made you how to tell that story? Well, the whole project actually started with me meeting my wife eight years ago. And my wife, she works as a fashion photographer. 
And I have always been a little bit scared of the fashion industry and the beauty industry. I, you know, beauty is scary because it also reminds us of hierarchies, but beauty is also attractive. So it's a very ambivalent feeling to, I had a very ambivalent feeling to the fashion industry and the beauty industry. So I, I asked her to tell me everything you, about your profession. I'm, I'm very curious. And she started to tell me about uh, the strategies of the different uh, clothing brands and the companies. And uh, she told me, for an example, about like uh, in more expensive brands, the, the models are never smiling. They're like looking down on the consumer. And the cheaper brands, the models are smiling like, yeah, welcome to our little uh, in crowd. Yeah. And for not that much money, you can buy a position with us like this uh, mixed skin color group, you know. So she she was pointing out many different things in the marketing strategies that I thought was interesting. But then the point where where I felt that this is really something that I, that I maybe wanted to make a film about was when she told me about a friend of her that is a male model. And... Um, uh, this guy, he, he had been working as a, as a car mechanic uh, when he was uh, around 19 years old or something. He was working as a car mechanic and he got street costed. So someone asked him, do you want to try out to work as a, as a model? And, you know, a male model is not really a high status profession. It's like they are considered vain and there, there are a lot of prejudice against uh, male models. So he was like saying, yeah, sure, I can try that. And everything happens very quickly for him. Because in two years from trying out to be a male model, he is uh, then two years later, one of the best paid models in the whole industry, the male models in the industry. And he have made a class journey from being a car mechanic to starting to live a, a little bit of a jet set life. And when he's up there on the top, he does a perfume campaign. Uh, which is the most prestigious thing you can do as a, as a model because then it's only your face basically and this, this product and these campaigns they are up for a long time and you earn a lot more money and they can make you sometimes into a profile they can make you like a, a, your persona known also uh, and what happens to this guy when he's up there on the top and he's doing this perfume campaign is that he's realizing oh my god I'm losing my hair I'm getting bored so he's basically losing his currency in his beauty. And the drop to go back to work as a car mechanic is quite big. Yeah. Uh, and and his, his female colleagues, they were joking always about, yeah, to find an exit as a female model, you can always marry rich, you can become a trophy wife, and then you, uh, then you, uh, then you can get out of this industry. But for the male models, they don't really have that kind of possibility to an exit. Uh, so he goes to his agent and he talks to his agent and he shows this hair problem and the agent says, okay, maybe you have two more years in the industry of being a male model. Uh, but we also have another problem. And in order to push your career now the two last years, uh, we have to deal with that. The perfume campaign that, that you did, uh, you are so, so connected to it. So no one else wants to book you on the same level of jobs. You're too connected with that brand. So we need to rebrand you. So it would be great if you get together with a famous girlfriend. And this guy is like, you know, oh, but, but what about love? <laughs> and, uh, and the agent is like, yeah, yeah, but okay, come on, you can, can be a win-win, right? Like that you're good for business and good for relationship. Uh, and uh, I got to know about the term branded couple. I hadn't heard about that term before. Uh, and I, I thought it was interesting that you, you know, even in the most private parts of our life, economy is an aspect that we are dealing with. Before it was at least like, okay, family life and love life that is separated from, from business and, and, and economy. Uh, so I thought, okay, I can make a movie that is having this set up in the starting of the film. We have Carl and Jaya, they are a branded couple. Uh, and I started to pitch the film. Uh, to uh, to my friends and and to different generations and so on. I, I pitched the film to people that are born in in like 60s and the 70s, and when I told them, okay, it's about Carl and Yaya and they are a branded couple. All the people born in the 60s and the 70s, they go, oh, how horrible! But what about love? You know. And then I pitched the film for people that was born in the millennium, and I said, yeah, then we have Carl and Yaya, they are a branded couple. This young one, there you go, just go, aha, uh -huh, okay. Mm. 
So <laughs> their reaction towards the, the concept of branded copy was completely different. And I couldn't tell, okay, is it the new generation that is cynical or is it the my generation that is naive? Uh, but it was definitely an attitude change on how you look on the idea of your closest partner as someone that is also uh, like a, a, a speculation in, in the business that you're dealing with. And that was basically the starting point of the film. Mm-hmm.